Which is the whole slide, Cameron. Okay, great. Just making sure that nothing's occluded. All right, so let's get started. I'm a social psychologist, which means that I've spent um, my training working on empirical studies to try and understand how people think about um, beliefs, attitudes, behaviors, and, and why they make certain decisions. I do have two affiliations, one with the Winton Center, as mentioned, but today I'm talking to you from the Department of Psychology because uh, in this talk, I'll, I'll just say explicitly, we think pro-environmental behaviors are good and we should encourage people to do more of them. And the, the Winton Center is very neutral, so they wouldn't endorse the statement even as soft as that. So my main goal is to try and understand in this line of work why people are making pro-environmental decisions. And I hope it can be relevant to traffic's uh, goals and we'll see if we can hook in um, and discuss a bit of that at the end. So if we're trying to get people to behave more pro-environmentally, both conserving resources and, uh, and doing actively good things, it makes sense that we would intuitively think we just need to tell them, hey, look, there's a giant garbage patch in the middle of the Pacific, or using more energy causes climate change, and that they would adjust. Oh, but then if you give them that info and they don't adjust, we think, oh, maybe they have the wrong values. Maybe they need to love uh, the environment more. So then we try and change their values. But these approaches are, are limited. And we have 30 years of trying these uh, for environmental purposes specifically, and they don't really work. And so we might back up and say, is this specific to the environment? And I'll tell you, I don't think it is. Uh, I think facts in general are weak. They're weak to update people's attitudes or change their behavior. And we can see that in other domains like health, uh, finances and, and cultural hotspots. So we, having the facts is not enough as the scientists and practitioners. What do we do then? This is um, a diagram of my research line and I'll walk us through some of these studies today. Let's start at the far left, which for me is the earliest. So the, um, the thing that would emerge first um, in a person's life. Let's talk about individual personalities. When a psychologist says personality, they're probably referring to the fact that people are different and that they predictably behave and think and feel in different ways. That's it. It's, it's kind of a large piece, but um, because it touches thoughts and behaviors. Uh, but it, it's not so wiggly as that sounds. It, it can be measured quite well now. I'd say personality psychology is one of the more strongly robust areas of psychology. So when we're looking at this guy in the park and we're trying to think, is he going to throw the uh, bottle in the trash or in the recycling? We might wonder, is he extroverted? Does he like going to museums? Uh, does, does he care about um, being nice to people? They don't immediately sound relevant, but it turns out they are, and I'll walk you through why. Personality is, is so important, and the reason it's worth studying is because it does associate uh, rather strongly with, with life outcomes like going to jail, income, educational attainment, divorce, things that we all care about. We want to know why they happen to us. It turns out that early life personality predicts these things to some extent. It predicts them as strongly as intelligence, which is a bit of a surprise. The other thing is that personality emerges before we develop our strong cultural attitudes, for example, about the Pacific Garbage Patch or wildlife trafficking. It's going to occur before these. So if it influences those, that's, that's of interest, that we want to know that. It happens early in childhood. That's not to say that personality doesn't change. Uh, it can change, but it is mostly set and mostly doesn't change. So in our first study, we measured six different kinds of personality there on the left, and we had hypotheses for the first three. We thought that openness, uh, conscientiousness, and extroversion would be related to more pro-environmental behavior, and we did this in a survey study. By the way, please feel free to interrupt me uh, for clarification. I don't have 45 minutes of study, so uh, there's plenty of time to help clarify. It's, we have a small group here. We thought that openness would be particularly important, and let me explain why. Openness is characterized by flexible, abstract thinking, 
uh, it's people who enjoy thinking about difficult problems. So they enjoy thinking hard, but they also are okay with not having the answer. So there's a tolerance of ambiguity and, uh, and it's closely related to working memory capacity and other general measures of intelligence. People who are open also like bucking the trend. They like being a little counter uh, culture and they like aesthetic experiences like going to museums and walking in nature or walking in a beautiful building as well. So I thought that openness would be particularly related to um, pro-environmental behavior because if you think about flexible long-term and long-distance thinking styles, that's exactly what's necessary to think about environmental problems, which are really quite abstract. I imagine that me taking a flight tomorrow is going to maybe contribute to climate change in Bangladesh in some amount of years to people I don't know. That's very abstract. People who are high in, open, high in openness might be better at doing those kinds of thoughts. So what we did is we came up with a list of emissions reducing behaviors. So this is focused on greenhouse gases in this study. And they vary. They, some are transportation, some are diet, et cetera. We piloted these materials and um, used this one. Two example items, how often do you eat meat, which is reversed, and how often do you turn your personal electronics off or in low power mode when not in use? So covering a, a range of domains here. I don't think that any of these is particularly well measured in that if they say, you know, I eat meat frequently, I don't know exactly how many times a week that means, but across the whole scale, we can try and get at a general measure of pro-environmental uh, behavior frequency. The first thing we did was a linear regression, and we I just asked, is personality relinked to the overall behavior frequency? And you can see that we we use many covariates here, so this is not, um, any results you see are not going to be due to people being liberal or conservative, young, old, male, female, high education, low education. So these should be more pure personality effects. And what we see uh, is openness has the strongest link with uh, pro-environmental behavior, high openness, more pro-environmental behavior, and there are weak effects for these other two uh, traits as well. So what we did from there, we wanted to ask, okay, how is liking aesthetic experiences and being counterculture linked to pro-environmental behavior? It's quite a jump, actually. So we, we uh, I'll skip that. We measured in this study two other things. We measured two ways that people think about the environment. So both of these at the top and the bottom are attitude scales, the NEP and the CNS. I could explain in detail. But... They have items like, uh, do you think the earth has limited resources? Or um, do I feel part of the natural world? And so they're tapping a more general sense of how people think about themselves in relationship to the environment. And what we saw was that openness is associated with more of these pro-environmental attitudes. And then those attitudes are associated with the behavior. And once you account for this model, we did a mediation here, uh, the openness has no more direct effect, which, which uh, we don't, this isn't causal evidence, but it's suggestive. And what it means is that you can account for all of the association between openness and behavior with these attitude scales. So it suggests that maybe openness leads to attitudes, which then leads to behavior. That was published a couple years ago in Environment and Behavior. That's one of my highest cited pieces, so people do like that. Um, and then recently, we just published another work, which is not about individual small pro-environmental behaviors, but then about big ones, who installs solar panels in their home. And we used um, a large-scale database and, um, and looked at personality measures. And we tried to ask, is personality related to who installs solar panels in Germany, and does it matter about their risk preferences or their environmental concern? And to our surprise, we found that the answer is no. Personality doesn't really matter for solar panel install in Germany over this time period. That's contrary to some earlier work in the UK about solar panels. And we argue in the paper that it may be because in Germany, there's very large subsidies from the government for installing solar panels. So it's not actually much of a financial risk. So it, it's, it's very accessible and normative. So maybe in that case, personality becomes less important. So in sum, 
I think we're seeing evidence that individual differences do predict pro-environmental behavior in adulthood, particularly openness. But I'll just say to you directly, I don't know if that extends to uh, using um, illegally traded um, plant or animal goods, and that would be worth studying. It should probably, my, my intuition is it would apply to whether one engages in the, in the sale of those. Um, but as a consumer, it probably depends on how they're thinking about what that purchase means to them. It's not clear, even though we have identified which personality traits are associated with conservation, that we could use those to intervene. So um, you, you may have heard of Cambridge Analytica recently using Facebook and targeting people based on their personality to perhaps change voting behavior. Uh, this is an ethically challenging area. So even if we know that high openness people do this or that, it's not clear that we could change people's openness nor uh, speak directly to those characteristics. So moving on from personality for a moment, I want to give a couple studies about context. We've been talking about individual differences. How are people different than each other? But let's talk about how uh, our social context matters, the people around us, uh, the societies we're in, the situations in which we find ourselves. In general, people vastly undervalue how much what's happening around them affects their thoughts and behavior. We think of ourselves as unitary, consistent, uh, internally driven beings, but in fact, our behavior is much changed by, by those around us. So let's see if that's true here as well. Here's our friend in the park again. And now the question is, is his pro-environmental behavior going to depend on whether these people are around him watching him? I'll suggest yes. So we are motivated, all of us, to feel good about ourselves and the groups we belong to. Um, and that's a basic tenet in many of the social identity theories and social psychology. And it can explain how people are a bit defensive about criticism, both to them or their group, or they latch on to positives very easily. And across our life, whatever the domain, behaviors that other people can see signal what groups we belong to and our quality, essentially. So if we're doing something really good and other people can see it, then we know that that affects how they view us, but the same is true for a bad thing. So visible behaviors are especially important here. The thing is that some pro-environmental behaviors are visible to other people. In this case, I'm gonna argue that they then play a role in how we see other people and how they see us, what identities they imagine that we have. For example, the bag on the left, uh, bringing reusable bags to the grocery, this is visible to other people. Um, but conserving water in, in, in the home on the right is much less visible. We don't know which of our coworkers use a lot of water versus less water. So because one is more visible than the other, we might expect that it behaves differently. Um, it, 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 the predictors of that behavior are different. At this point, I started using a broader set of pro-environmental behaviors in my research. So not just emissions reduction, but also whether you talk to people about the environment, do you educate yourself? Uh, and so now we have an even broader scale, uh, including some of these social things that don't directly reduce emissions, but are part of uh, environmental behavior, I would argue. Let's go through briefly some earlier work to show you where this came from. So there was, a, there was a cool study in 2010, and they found that taking college students and priming them so that they felt like they were being watched and that they felt like they needed to be high status made them prefer eco products, green products. This was a difficult study to interpret, but it made it look like, okay, maybe in some contexts, people actually prefer green products to other luxury goods. They called this effect green to be seen, quite memorable. And now, a few years later, I saw another study which said that uh, when conservatives and liberals are given the opportunity to purchase an energy efficient light bulb, the conservatives avoided the light bulb, but only when it came with a sticker that said protect the environment. So the conservatives are reacting to the sticker. And I think what they're reacting to is the implication of some identity they don't want to be, want to be associated with. They're okay with having the energy efficient light bulb but they don't want it if it brings along a label that 
affects how other people see them. We might call this the opposite of green, a uh, brown to keep down. So I think the main innovation in my research line here is showing that these are the same effect. They're both identity signaling. It just depends on which group you're in and which group you want to be in, where you are along the spectrum of environmentalism. So let's test that. I gave a talk on this, by the way, a few years ago in Texas, and I saw this and, and it is a perfect example of what I mean here. Not only do these stickers indicate what groups the driver belongs to, but they also, at the top there, it says not a liberal. They also indicate what groups that person does not belong to. So it may be that this is a real life effect. Just um, to tell you how we measured identity, um, I'm asking people whether they see themselves as an environmentalist. And across the studies, you can see over here on the right, online study of Americans, most people are identifying in the middle or even uh, middle high with this. So that might surprise you, but most people see themselves somewhat as an environmentalist in the samples that we were studying. However, there is variation. There's uh, still people at the low end, very high ends of the scale. So let's start plotting out what this would look like. If we expect environmentalists to do more pro-environmental behaviors, I mean, that would make sense. Let's, let's check to see that our data shows that first. So on the x-axis at the bottom here on the, is environmental identity, where on the left would be people who are not environmentalists or don't want to be seen that way. And on the right are people who say, yes, I identify very much with being an environmentalist. And our y-axis is the frequency of pro-environmental behaviors. Uh, it actually ranged from one to five. I'm showing a, a, a reduced scale here. And higher is more behaviors. This is the measure of central tendency surrounded by the 95% confidence interval. And what we see is a positive relationship. Okay, environmentalists doing more behaviors. That's good. Now let's check. For behaviors that individuals said were more visible, to other people, are they doing them a different amount based on their identity? And the, here's, the, here's the hypothesis. We were expecting that people who are high in environmental identity would do pro-environmental behaviors that are visible more, but the opposite for people who are low. People who are low in pro-environmental identity will do visible behaviors less. This is the pattern that we saw in this, again, controls for, um, whether you're liberal or conservative, it controls for socioeconomic status. And what we see is the solid line is the high visibility behaviors. There's a stronger relationship between identity and behavior for the visible ones. So that's, that's in line with predictions. And the main difference we're seeing in this particular study is that low uh, identity, the uh, people who are not environmentalists are doing fewer behaviors when those behaviors are visible. One note here, this is a multi-level study because we assessed visibility uh, within behavior within person. So um, we didn't use the same behaviors as highly visible. We asked each person which behaviors were visible to them. And there's 21 different behaviors and then use that to construct this. We ran a couple more studies. I wanna show you just one of them, the final study in this series, because we use a different sample. There's 430 people. We included some new measures, and we saw this pattern, which is actually the same, but uh, the other side. So you again see that the solid line of high visible behavior shows a stronger relationship between identity and behavior. But now the gap, the, the, the real effect we're seeing is for the environmentalists. They're doing more of the visible behaviors because they want uh, maybe to be seen as being an environmentalist. So across the studies, we show both effects. We never showed the crossover interaction um, and more work in place uh, currently. So, uh, yep, that paper came out last year. Feel free to look that up. In sum, we think there's evidence that people are signaling their social identities with environmental behavior. And keep in mind that this is not liberal and conservative. I mean, you could say, we could imagine they might be signaling lots of behaviors, but these, this wasn't liberal because we controlled for that. It's something else related to environmental uh, engagement. So the problem is that current campaigns, you see a couple across the bottom here, may backfire in people who don't want to be seen as an environmentalist. It's not that they're anti-environment. They just might not want to be labeled an environmentalist. And if you 
give them a label that has a green earth and a leaf and it says eco-friendly, they are going to avoid that product or service because they don't want to be associated with it. So that's the danger. And in, on that, uh, well done on the cheek campaign because I think avoiding certain kinds of branding could be very effective depending on who we're trying to market to. So that's exactly in line with, um, with what I'm seeing in my studies. The last set of studies that I'm going to walk through are about identity. And the reason that this box is in between personality and behavior is because remember, we think that early life personality may have be driving pro environmental attitudes and identity and that drives behavior. So instead of just measuring identity, let's, Let's try and figure out where it comes from or what's associated with it or try and measure it better. Across all of my studies, I'm showing a strong link between environmentalist identity and pro-environmental behavior. Okay, but looking in the general public, it looks like identification with environmentalists is plummeting uh, within my lifetime. So what is going on with that? Is that, is that a problem? Um, in society generally and then secondarily, if people are suddenly reversing their explicit added, uh, statements about identity, then are we measuring it well if we're asking them to tell us their explicit statements about identity? Okay. How are environmentalists seen lately? In the US at least, and let's get back to how all of this research is based in the US, except for that study in Germany. Uh, let's get back to that at the end. In the US, environmentalists are seen quite negatively, I would argue. They're, uh, here's a cool study showing that they're seen as, in general, not just, a, not just a threat to economic development, but also a threat to society in general, okay? Environmentalists are seen as activists, and activists are associated with a number of other words. So the environmentalists and feminists in this study were seen as militant, aggressive, uh, and other negative words. There were some positive words, um, but mostly negative. So let's keep that in mind for why people might avoid saying that they want to be seen as an environmentalist. Here's a comic for you. Uh, I started my vegetarianism for health reasons, then it became a moral choice, and now it's just to annoy people. If you've ever watched people react to a vegetarian at dinner, that's uh, they definitely feel like it's, it's an affront to meat eating. Mm -hmm. So let's think about identity here. We've been imagining that there's a spectrum of identity, um, people telling you, yes, I'm in this group and I wanna be in this group, or no, I don't. And on the right, we have our extremists, uh, a bit tongue in cheek there because of the, the last few slides, but someone who sees themselves as an environmentalist and wants to be seen that way. And on our left, this guy, he might not be anti-environment, but he doesn't want to be seen as an environmentalist, or he might also be anti-environmentalist. Now, psychologists also study how people uh, uh, think about their associations with the world, with themselves, with the world, attitudes. And in this case, we tried to measure identity in an implicit way. So how are people thinking about this? Not how they consciously report to you, but how they unconsciously generate this. So this, Implicit identification here is similar to, you've probably heard um, some of the news about Starbucks doing implicit bias training or uh, Clinton in the last election campaign mentioned um, implicit racial bias. This is the same sort of idea that sometimes we have thoughts or patterns, attitudes that arise without our awareness or our control. So we wanted to come up with a way of measuring implicit identification with environmentalists. And I've tilted this line a bit because I think that they're going to be correlated. Even though they are different constructs, probably somewhat related. So we used a novel task called an implicit association test, um, but novel because in this case we used it for environmentalist and it was based on identity. And so people would press a button uh, many times, hundreds of trials, and we would measure how quickly they press the button. This, I'm just going to show you one trial. You can hold your two fingers out in front of you if you want to simulate this. And you would press your left finger if I show you a word in the center of the screen that relates to another person. And you would press the right finger if the word in the center of the screen relates to you personally or a word related to environmentalists. So here it is. I'm going to, press, I'm going to show you a screen. Boom. 
I don't know how quickly you press that, but if you press too slow, we didn't count it. If you press too fast before you saw it, we didn't count it. We were only counting these very fast, um, hard to control reactions. And then you'd switch. Environmentalists is now associated with other and self items are by themselves. And you do this a few times and we can get, how quickly do people associate environmentalism with self compared to environmentalism with other? So we measured this across a couple thousand people at Project Implicit. And this study was unique because uh, we pre-registered it. That is, we said what we thought we were going to find and how we were going to test it all in advance. We have open data and open code, uh, which makes the results a little more believable. The other new thing about this study is that we measured how people approach policy issues. So we didn't just do the small pro-environmental behaviors, but we also looked at um, some measures of how they wanted their society organized in terms of government and environment. So we asked them, you know, should the United States put in more environmentalist laws and this and that. We averaged those together. And in some of the studies, we also introduced a novel issue. I wrote a fake article for the Los Angeles Times, and we showed this to participants all over the U.S. And we asked them, should this development, which has some controversy about its environmental review, should it be halted or should they go ahead with development? And we measured those attitudes and uh, included them as well. So now we have a broad-based policy preferences measure in addition to our behavior measure. The first thing to show you across these uh, participants is that explicit identification with environmentalisms, uh, sorry, environmentalists, people who see themselves as environmentalists and want to be seen that way, also associate environmentalist words with the self more quickly than with others. It's not a strong effect, 0.25 correlation, but it is robust. And here we'll show you the main results of all four studies put together. On the left-hand side of the screen, we see uh, the four studies and then a, and a, an aggregate, and then again, the four studies and an aggregate. And what we're seeing here is how much in each of the studies does some variable predict pro-environmental behavior? So the top half of the screen shows that on all four studies, explicit identity, how much I say I uh, am an environmentalist, predicts behavior strongly. Those are big effects. But on the bottom half of the screen, we see that uh, implicit identity, how quickly they react to that task, that novel task, once we control for the effect of explicit identity, doesn't predict uh, pro-environmental behavior uniquely because that meta-analytic estimate overlaps with zero. So once you put them both in the model and you see if they uniquely predict, implicit falls out. It doesn't seem to do anything for predicting pro-environmental behavior. Now on the next screen, I'm gonna show you the results exactly the same as this, but instead of for behavior, for policy preferences. So just imagine in your head for a second, do I expect the same result here? It's gonna be explicit but not implicit? Or a different result? Just think about that for a moment. It's always good to imagine the results before we actually see them. And here they are. Blink and you missed it. They look basically exactly the same. You can see that in study one, we found an effect, and a unique effect for um, implicit identity, which is why we followed it up in several additional studies and tried to measure things better and better. And the better we measured them, the more the effect looked like zero. So that's why to do meta-analysis. One study may not be enough. You have to keep trying to replicate until you can make sure that the finding is robust. So what I take away from this is that the explicit self-reports, the four questions about identity are sufficient. Uh, that's enough to help predict whether people are going to behave in this way or what kinds of preferences they say they have. Implicit identity is less useful. So there's no evidence here that individuals can't or won't report their environmentalist identity, even though environmentalism is a bit taboo. This, this may be because they're not admitting it to their close others, they're admitting it to the researcher. So uh, it's, it's not clear whether this might change depending on which persons or context they're signaling to. Another thing that's not clear here is that it, we may not have shown an effect on behavior, but it might be that implicit identity affects certain behaviors. Like uh, when you're distracted and you're walking down the street and you have a quick decision, 
that wasn't the kind of behavior we measured. So it might affect those um, slightly more automatic behaviors. And I might ask, we studied one identity uh, and also um, political orientation. What other social identities are associated with, uh, what other social identities are associated with environmentally significant behaviors? Can we think of other identities that we might measure in future studies that um, could be relevant, that people might be trying to signal or not signal uh, with regard to conserving water, energy, et cetera? Because if we can identify them, then we can think of ways in which those contexts can uh, trigger or avoid triggering those identities. So I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, we have uh, plenty of time. And uh, just in sum, both individual differences and social influences, I think, affect pro-environmental behavior more than we generally realize. The discussion that I hear from practitioners practitioners uh, and non-psychologists is usually mostly about individual attitudes and values, but there's, there's more to it than that. Um, people's fundamental approaches to the world and the context in which they find themselves are going to be important. I don't know a lot about how this plays out outside the U.S. Some of these studies are um, consistent with effects um, found in other countries, but most of the pro-environmental literature is from the U.S., the U.K., Australia, Germany, New Zealand, um, and so there isn't a huge literature in the developing world where, uh, or, or the countries in which most of the world lives. We don't really know um, the general human story for this. We just know about the um, context in which it's been studied. And broadly, about um, us when we're communicating about the environment. Do we know what identities we're signaling? Uh, do we know what kinds of groups our audience is associating with our target behavior? probably worth measuring. Um, at the very end here, just to say that the topic of environmental psychology and conservation psychology seem to be booming. I get a lot of media attention for my work when I'm publishing it. I didn't choose this area because it seems to be growing, but it, uh, I think it'll become increasingly important as, as the effects of climate change become more clear and uh, we start grappling with even increased population from where we are today. So that's it, and thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Cameron, for that um, very wonderful session.